Hi, everybody. Welcome to Special Education Thursday for March. Um, my name is Molly Whalen, and I host Special Education Thursdays for Advocates for Justice in Education, which is the federally designated parent training and information center for DC uh, for special ed and disabilities. And we created Special Education Thursday as a very brief webcast to take a look, a little bite-sized piece of an area of special education and talk about it with an expert in the field and someone who's working here in the DC metropolitan area and see if we can kind of, um, uh, you know, look into it a little bit more and get some understanding um, for parents and on a parent space. So we talk a lot about on our webinars or webcasts that we always like to make these parent friendly. So we are recording them, and they are located on the AJE website under Special Education Thursdays, and we actually have a library uh, for about 12 months, and we've got about uh, 30 different uh, webcasts up there on all kinds of topics. Today's topic is going to be what to consider when considering a special education school or a non-public placement for a student with a disability, and I'm really thrilled to have with us. Uh, someone who has vast amounts of experience in special education and, and very much so here in this area, the local area, it's Piper Phillips, who's the CEO of the Phillips Program for Children and Families, and they are located in both the nearby uh, Virginia and Maryland suburbs. So welcome, Piper. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Piper, we always start with, um, just to make it personal, how did you get into this field? And I know you've held a lot of different positions, but talk about a little bit about what you're doing now, but, you know, how did you, you get started? Well, it's a, it's a funny story, and there are a lot of teachers in my family, and I think I was just sort of uh, born with the gene to be a teacher, and I grew up in Falls Church and had a... Uh, inkling or a uh, desire to have my own uh, school and we had this little structure in our backyard we called it a garden house and in fourth grade I started going around on Saturday mornings gathering up neighborhood kids of which there were several who actually had some disabilities and holding school and the requirement was you had to be in a grade lower than me in order to attend <laughs> it was it was Sickingly traditional, <laughs> uh, and and really, um, my dad was a was a behavioral psychologist, and so mm -hmm. I certainly um, you know had exposure at home to uh, a number of things, and um, went right into uh, special education as a freshman. Went off to uh, George Peabody College for Teachers, which was the sort of premier special education college. It's now part of Vanderbilt University, but that's where like the Peabody picture vocabulary test and all came from. And they had yeah. you out yeah. in schools right away. So I've, yeah. I've, uh, you know, I guess I've had my uh, toe in it for most of my life. And tell me, I know you've got a lot of different places that you work, but can you name a couple of the local uh, special education schools or schools that you've worked with here? Yeah, absolutely. I have worked uh, uh, at, actually at Phillips, uh, as a, an assistant teacher and teacher back in the 70s when it was known as School for Contemporary Education. I also worked at the um, Kingsbury Day School in the district. And I worked at the uh, Kennedy Institute, Lieutenant Joseph P. Kennedy Institute, not within their school, but in their um, community-based residential program for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Worked with CSAC, um, which is also local, serving uh, youth on the autism spectrum. And uh, also worked at the McLean School um, when ah. I kind of was ventured in the uh, sort of more of the learning dis uh, disability arena. Okay. And um, I wanted you to say that because I, I think you're, the vast experience that you have and in all these different kinds of special education schools in the local area, and we always make this webcast a little local. We try not mm -hmm. to talk too national and talk to really the local. So I appreciate you sharing that. So let's dive into it, because this is a question I know I get asked a lot as a parent, um, and I'm sure you do too, but what is a special education school, or in this area we call them non-publics, which I have learned is not everywhere in the country, but 
Right. Well, how do you describe a, a, a special education school or a non-public school? Yeah. Uh, well, I I combine that. I say a non-public special education school because if you look on the uh, you know the federal definition of non-public, it can encompass um, you know parochial schools and independent mm. schools, and so. I always tag the special education onto the non-public, and it's a little bit of a misnomer because um, many, many, if not all of of the students who are referred to the non-public special education programs are coming from the public schools, and it's part of the continuum. So even though they're operated independent of the county school systems, they are, you know, a, a part of that continuum, and and um, you know, so sometimes when you say non-public, that also confuses people. So it, it yeah, always yeah. seems like it needs an explanation. Right, right. And I think it's also really clear to say, even though they are independent, maybe they're a not-for-profit or a private school, they're not, um, they're not what you would think in a traditional private school. They're That's not correct. a, you know, Georgetown visitation or, you know, um, right. um, you know a, a Catholic school. They're specializing in special education. So they, right, they exactly. Yeah, well, and then a, the programs that have, um, that are really fully special education where all of the students have an individual education plan actually have a um, a whole different set of regulations that they have to adhere mm -hmm. to um, and they are approved by the the state uh, education departments uh, OSI uh, in the district and MSDE and uh, VDOE for uh, Maryland and Virginia. So it, the regulations are completely different. Requirements are different than an independent slash um, private school where families are paying tuition. Um, and, however, and I, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say, I think it's really worth um, emphasizing that, that these are not um, schools that just say, okay, we're going to do a different curriculum or we're, we're being small or we're going to focus on this. But there's, a, there's quite a, I was always surprised, but quite elaborate certification and reviews and um, policies and, and processes that a special education school has to, has to do um, to, you know, get that label. So it's, I, I always feel like as a parent, um, it's quite impressive, you know, how much and how, how detailed and how policy oriented a, a special education school has to be. Yeah, they are very much so. And it is, it is a uh, requirement in, you know, if you're getting federal funds, which the tuition has a, you know, small percentage of the funds that come in with tuition for a particular student uh, is federal dollars. So we do have a uh, much higher level of uh, regulatory oversight than, mm -hmm. than any other mm -hmm. schools, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And so let's get to it. If you were a parent and you're thinking, well, I have a child with a disability or in special education and really concerned, how do students get placed or admitted to a non-public special education school? Right. Well, there there is a process, and and there are uh, laws that govern the individual education plans and the amount of time um, that can transpire between evaluations and recommendations and meetings and that sort of thing, um, which uh, ostensibly keeps uh, the movement going because it can be a a long arduous process, but. Typically what happens is a family is is aware or uh, either on their own or the school uh, brings it to their attention that their child is having some type of um, performance issue within the public school setting and a uh, team meeting is held uh, with the family, with anybody who might be working with that youth in the community and with the school team to determine whether or not, A, they're eligible for special education services, and that may require testing and observations and whatnot. And then once that is determined, then the school system is going to make a recommendation in terms of how those services are rendered, whether that's in the general education classroom that the student is already in, um, whether it uh, means that they're going to be some additional services, what we call related services, that might be speech and language, for example, that would be uh, provided. And then um, in some cases, they, the school system may have their own sort of 
um, separate special education services. So there are a lot there are a lot of um, uh, different um, uh, models, if you will, mm -hmm. de dependent on the needs of that student. And then when the the services that the public school system has have have uh, if they are they're not always um if they're exhausted in terms of being able to find the uh and meet the needs of that student then the team would take a look at referring that student out to a non-public special education program and that that is a pretty you know can be a pretty complicated uh process mm -hmm. but um that's basically what happens so we we aren't out there as a non public special education program um doing your typical uh kind of marketing and whatnot that a private school may be however we do do some of it in and in, in that's important because we want folks to know about these options um, mm -hmm. if in fact their their child needs it um, and so we're big advocates on that mm -hmm. and I, I think it's also important because this is something I didn't realize for a while that when a um, school system places or you know has a student or puts a student in non-public special education that student remains a let's say a DCPS or a charter mm -hmm. school that student yeah. remains a DCPS student just being educated in that non-public school so that That's local school system is part of the IEP and um, is responsible for maybe maybe responsible for transportation um, all of those elements so it's kind of a I'm sure that must be hard for your school too, but it is kind of a two hands are holding the you know same child kind of thing. Oh, absolutely, and and we collaborate and make a point of collaborating with the public school system in terms of of providing what that student needs in order to be able to return to the public school um, in in whatever you know program that may be appropriate for them at that point and one of the the analogies that I use and I think it may be helpful to parents who are not um, in a you know don't have a, a child in a non-public special education program at this point and and for many others kind of understanding our role and how and why is a student referred to us and others are not and I use a medical analogy I hmm. I say that many of the students that we're serving in a non-public special education program are sort of like a a um uh, a, a three or a four in terms of, you know, stage three or stage four, if you had an illness and you're, you're seeing your regular physician and your physician says you're kind of out of my, my expertise right mm -hmm. now, I want to send mm -hmm. you over to this clinic or this practice that specializes. And um, that's, I think, one of the hallmarks of a non-public special education program is that everybody in the building is trained in the different protocols and interventions and in particular model that a, a program may offer and um, the dosage so I, I, lo I love the word <laughs> dosage so, so the dosage of the services is much greater than you're going to get um, in, ah, you know yeah. typically in a in a different program and hence that would be why and that would would be an analogy for sort of that continuum with the intent just as with a physical illness that you are are addressing and providing you know the need and providing that intervention with the expectation that as that um, person um, improves that they're going to be able to step down and and return to mm -hmm. a, a less um, a uh, heavy intervention kind of program. No, well, that's a really good analogy. And and I guess I also want to stop and talk about these non-public special education schools also don't serve all of all disabilities. I mean, I don't think no. there's one out there that does them all, but um, right. but they can you talk to like how schools tend to serve maybe certain disabilities or one kind of disability or how that kind of comes about? Yeah, if you're looking at the non-public special education programs within the Washington D.C. region, which includes Maryland and Virginia, which there there are a, a decent number, they absolutely um, specialize. So we have programs that that specialize 
uh, in learning disabilities or anxiety disorders, ADHD, that type of thing. They, there are others that specialize in autism. Um, there may be programs uh, like ourselves who really specialize in uh, working with kids with what we call and the nomenclature changes all the time, behavioral health needs. And, and so we, we serve youth that have some type of a, a behavioral challenge. It may be internalized, it may be externalized, it can look very, very different, um, but it, it is such that it's making it um, exceedingly difficult for them to make progress in a different setting. So we may have at any of the Phillips campuses students with a diagnosis of autism or even an intellectual disability. Certainly we see many, many kids with mental health issues um, mm -hmm. who may have had trauma. Um, but, um, you know, it's kind of that behavioral health component that is, is the uh, primary reason that a student would be referred to us. But the public schools have an array of services as well. They they have services to meet the needs of, of youth with learning disabilities or ADHD or uh, on the autism spectrum or with intellectual disabilities. It's It again is what, you know, is that sort of a quote unquote stage three or stage four at the point where the, where what the public school system is able to provide is not sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. So you you absolutely can, um, you know, if you're looking for a particular disability area, you you know you do have to um, discern what the specialty is um, of a particular non-public special yeah. education program. And and so what should parents? I mean, do you have any advice for parents on what they should think about when they're looking at? So you know, they may not have a lot of options for a non-public special ed school, but let's say they've got two, or you know, they they they've got a you know they've gone through the prog due process and they're getting in place and they're giving two options, or they may just be looking themselves. Is there anything you tell them to kind of? look at when they're looking at the school, you know, both um, maybe just visually as well as like thinking about programming? Yeah, well, the, you know, there are a number of factors and, and different things have different levels of importance to a family. Um, certainly location can be a, right. a factor in the D.C. region where we have plenty of traffic, but you want to, you know, you want to really listen to how that particular school addresses the needs that your child is presenting with um, and get, you know, get a little nitty gritty. So if it's a, a student with a significant uh, learning disability and um, you want to understand what their reading intervention program is, you know, ask for for specifics, ask for how that's delivered and the frequency of the mm -hmm. delivery. Um, certainly, you know, you want to get a feel for the uh, physical environment and kind of the cultural environment of a program. You want a, a program that's going to invite you to come in and observe and, and talk to them. And I think schools are very, um, it, you know, and it's it's in everyone's best interest to be very uh, transparent and upfront about what a school can and can't do. We don't want to, um, you know, encourage a student to be enrolled in a program that ultimately is not the best one for them. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the mission and the, the heart of all of the non-public special education programs that I've ever interacted with in this region, and I've probably interacted with most of them on, on some level over the years, is we we are interested and love working with these youth and want to maximize you know their potential and help them um, make that transition uh, once they're finished with us wherever that is to whether it's back to a public school or a, a you know another non-public that's maybe not as intensive or out into the world of work or or off to mm -hmm. uh, post-secondary education. So I you know uh, and the other piece that I think is so so important is network with other parents, talk mm -hmm. to other parents who are in the process or have already. Um, you know, made it through the process and their child is in a non-public special education program or they have been and, and are now, um, you know, have completed that and and get their 
um, thoughts and, and recommendations and um, advice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's really true. I think that's what, that's kind of why we also did this uh, special ed- education Thursdays in, in the sense of like getting some parent advice uh, on different topics and parent speak. And um, yeah. what, so I'd love to also, as we're, I always say we kind of run out of time faster on these things that we want to, but um, what are some, you know, certainly special education can be a contentious topic in a lot of school districts. And sometimes this is not an easy route for parents. And we kind of talked about how you get in, but sometimes lawyers are involved and, um, you know, the school systems, you know, are always kind of uh, seem to always say, well, inclusion and being with non-disabled peers. But I'd love for you to speak to, you know, it is a more restrictive setting for students to go to. And sometimes that could be um, uh, shocking to a family, but oftentimes, you know, great for the students. So what are some positives that you see about non-public schools? Because I think they often get a, a you know, in our, in our inclusion world of, of education, kind of get a bad rap sometimes because they're, oh, those are, you know, self-contained schools. But what do you see as the positives or what can your program do because you are a, a non-public school with, with students of need? Right. Well, I, I, I see it all being positive, quite frankly, because if that's what they need at that point, then that's what they need. They have something that's going on that is not being addressed, um, not because the public school doesn't want to, but it isn't a part of the resources Mm -hmm. that they have. And, you know, again, it isn't any different than you, you know, your legs in a cast for two months because you broke your leg or whatever. Yes, it's quote unquote restrictive, but it's what you need at that point. And you're getting such um, sort of intense intervention and support. And I think the programs are, uh, again, as I said earlier, this is what we love to do. This is what, you know, this is our mission. Uh, The kids that are brought into these programs are welcomed. And Mm -hmm. um, that's not always the case in, in, uh, the public school, and I don't say that to denigrate them in any way, but this, you know, this is our our business and our desire. And in the public schools, they may not, uh, you know, all of the staff may not have that experience or that particular interest, or everybody mm-hmm. would be a special ed teacher. Um, so I, I've, you know, the reality is, is when we become adults, if we if we know ourselves, and not all of us know ourselves, and I think that's one of the things, a uh, wonderful advantage of a non-public special education program is kids can very much get to know themselves and their strengths mm-hmm. and what are mm-hmm. some of the accommodations or strategies that help them through. And and many adults struggle um, in relationships and jobs because they don't know that. And um, I I think that's such a tremendous gift. So as an adult, you may be aware and say, you know, I don't really do well with, um, I have to be, you know, clock in at eight and clock out at five. I need, um, you know, more freedom. And so I'm not going to select a career or I'm not going to accept a job in a situation that is, doesn't work for me. I need to work in a very small business or I want to work mm-hmm. for myself. Mm-hmm. So we're not all going out from these very large public schools of thousands of kids yeah. and working in that kind of environment. So the the sort of that, I, you know, I feel like that's a misnomer that gets – bantered around quite a bit of, oh, they need to be in public school and in that setting in order to be able to integrate into society. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that's true at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think there's a, you know, it gets into safety issues and support issues. And, and I think one of the yeah. things that um, I'd love for you to speak just about Phillips right now is the um, variety and flexibility and um, outside the box kind of programs you have like I'm I'm not even going to try to explain them if you could just highlight what you know what your favorite right Right. yeah well I I have a bunch of favorites actually but we we do uh, quite a bit of work with career and tech education you know what was formerly called vocational education and uh, students going out into the community into authentic jobs Uh, we partner with 30, 40 businesses at any given time uh, in both Northern Virginia and suburban Maryland for our students to go out. And then we have um, added a new 
program, umbrella program, which we call Career Partners, to just about two years ago. Uh, we have several um, career pathways that we are in various stages of. They're all active. Um, we have a building trades program, construction trades, where uh, the students are learning uh, all those wonderful uh, skills of house building and major repairs and renovations, both in Annandale and in Leesburg. Uh, we have a culinary arts program that is integrated with a vertical farm, so urban agriculture at our Laurel campus. And we do 3D design and print at both of our Virginia, or our Annadale and Fairfax uh, campuses, and actually offer that outside of the schools to adolescents and young adults on the autism spectrum. Um, but all of those, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to have 50 different career pathways. We've right, chosen right. these, um, you know, for a couple different reasons, but maybe the most important ones are that they all offer multiple career pathways if mm. a a um, student has an interest, but our, the primary focus is always the development of the soft job skills and really preparing the kids to be able to go out into the world of work right. and, and uh, take direction and show up on time and problem solve and work collaboratively. Um, and but they all um, offer industry certification, which can be, um, you know, we are talking now about stackable certifications and uh, helping um, the youth transition into the world of work and going off and getting a job somewhere with that OSHA certification, for example, uh, or the uh, ProServe or ServeSafe uh, certification. And then they're all just really great life skills. Right, um, right. And, yeah. So that's and, it's, and I think, yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad you shared this because I think that's also one of those benefits of a non-public special education school, that they have time to be teaching those life skills and adaptive living skills and all of that, that for, especially for our students with disability gets completely lost in a, in a general right. education setting and right. a large general education setting. Yeah. And it's so yeah. valuable. So uh, believe it or not, we've got like three minutes left. So okay. what I love to finish with is one thing that you wish um, all parents knew or you'd like to share with them uh, regarding special ed or non-public schools or, you know, the greater special education, you know, uh, world. What's your one piece of advice? Um, I think is uh, my advice is maintain uh, hope and uh, families when when their students are referred into a non-public special education program can have very mixed emotions about it. Some may be elated and have worked hard to get there. Others may, um, you know, be having to to really understand what is going on with with their child and what their needs are and and you know we all want the best for our our kids and I think that we are very fortunate in this area to have some excellent excellent non public special education programs mm -hmm. that have wonderful outcomes um you know you have to be you know you have to be realistic also um not everybody is is going off to a four year college and i don't know that that's necessarily the best thing anyhow um but you know maintain maintain hope and know that there are um experts in this area that will help and can help um whether it's even just a conversation of trying to figure out, you know, this is what's going on with my child and I'm really at a loss. Uh, mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. here, we've been here for 50 years. This is our 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you the number of times that people say, you know, that I hear from parents or, you know, through staff that, parents say, I wish I'd known about Philip sooner or, yeah, you know, okay. or fill in the blank with another non-public special education program. Mm -hmm. And even though we're, we've been around um, and we have uh, state associations and, and uh, other folks who certainly um, promote the services that we have, there's still so many families that, that are not aware and whether or not their child actually needs um, or eventually comes into a non-public special education program, they should still know about 
what what is out okay, there, what sure. kinds of right. services. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. And I think that, you know, I have to agree. I, I often tell parents who call in in, in, a de- in desperation. They're, you know, something's mm-hmm. wrong, something's worried, something's not working. Um, and I say even if you're not going to go or try to pursue a, a special education school or you're not sure about it, go visit. Go take an admissions yep. score, go, go open house. All of the non-publics are really open about that. And, and you get to see in action what, you know, um, you know, adaptive living skills classroom or a more a small right. self-contained classroom and the um, individual focus and all of those pieces. And it's just really helpful to be able to see the difference and see if it's something that fits, you know, what you think is needing for your child. So right. Um, yeah. we are right at 1 o'clock. Um, Piper, thank you so, so much. Everybody, this recording will be on the Special Education Thursday website at aje-dc.org, probably by this afternoon, if not uh, uh, but tomorrow. And uh, our next Special Education Thursday is on April 5th, and we're actually going to talk about um, special education law and why it favors inclusion. We thought it would be a nice pair up for after we talk about non-public special education and why um, the laws, you know, kind of leads a different way and, and why sometimes it can be challenging. So, and we'll be doing that on April 5th. So thanks so much, Piper, and I'm going to sign off. Thank you.